Welcome to the medication section of our It's a Joint Effort program. Uh, I'm Alexandra Charlton. I'm the pharmacist for rheumatology with Alberta Health Services. Uh, you may not see me around a lot in clinic, but do know that I'm often doing things uh, behind the scenes, working with your rheumatologist and the rest of the team. Um, if you do have questions or concerns that you want to discuss with me, that's great. My email address is here on the slide. Um, also, you can get in touch with me through the main clinic number or through your rheumatologist's office. Just know that because I'm only in clinic a day and a half a week that it may take me some time to get back to you. The reason that I'm showing this particular slide is just to show you the contrast between how the diseases were treated 20 years ago versus how it's treated now and all of the great, great uh, drugs that we have available have changed the outcomes. I also want to point out if you did not treat your arthritis, this is in particular is rheumatoid arthritis, or we were not treating your arthritis fully, meaning at remission or as close to remission as possible, the inflammation can lead to damage, which then can lead to severe damage and an inability to really use those joints. Patients who have been diagnosed since the turn of the century are very lucky in that the medications that they have available are far more numerous, they work better, and they have less side effects. So patients were able to alter therapy to get the best possible outcomes, meaning that we get the inflammation under control we keep it under control so that there isn't a chance for damage and even many years down the line those joints are still very functional. And this slide just illustrates how much the medications have really exploded over the last 20 years and how few medications were available before the 20th century. Many of the medications we don't even use anymore. Some of them aren't even available on the market anymore. And the ones that we do use, the methotrexate, sulfasalazine, hydroxychloroquine, and prednisone, we use very differently than they were used back then. Then along came the 21st century, and leflunamide was actually the very first drug that was purposely developed in order to treat inflammatory arthritis. All of the other medications that were used previously were found just by using them in other diseases and patients who had inflammatory arthritis improved as well. So that was the first one that then started really a whole boom in developing medications and you can see every year to every couple of years there's at least one new drug available and it started with leflunamide, which is a traditional type of DMARD, moved to the biologics, and now we're into what we call small molecules, so tofacitinib, baricitinib, apatacitinib, apremilast. Those are all oral medications that still have a lot in common with the biologics. And 10 years from now, we'll probably have a lot more medications as well. In the treatment of inflammatory arthritis, and it really doesn't matter which type of inflammatory arthritis, much of the medications that we use are the same, and the order in which we use them are often the same as well. Many patients come to us already taking symptom control medications, and that may be um, anti-inflammatories, herbal medications, things that are just helping with the symptoms. Then they come to see us and depending how poorly they're doing, how unwell they are, usually our first step, right, the first day that you see us is often corticosteroids, followed immediately by the disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs or DMARDs, and then about 20 to 25% of patients 
we'll have to move on to the more advanced therapies, the biologics and the JAK inhibitors. This slide is a slide that nobody likes, but it's a very important one to understand. None of the medications that we use are cures. They only control the disease for as long as you're taking them. Most people will have symptoms return within a few weeks to a few months. There's a small percentage of patients who, if their disease has been controlled for a very long time, we can start to decrease medications or doses of the medications and some may even be able to stop medications for a longer period of time. But there's very few people that can maintain a long remission without taking medication. The other issue that we have if we stop the medications too early or we stop and start medications a lot is that there's a chance that the second time around that the drug may not work as well. Um, also, restarting a drug means that it takes another 6 to 12 weeks before there's an effect. So that inflammation is there affecting the joints and causing damage. These are the three most common types of inflammatory arthritis. There are many, many more though. I think it's somewhere between 160 and 180. But Rheumatoid arthritis by far is the most common type of inflammatory arthritis and that's why there seems to be a lot more or there is a lot more medications that are available. So for a long time it was medications were developed for rheumatoid arthritis because the market was bigger and then they try them in other types of inflammatory arthritis and some worked and some didn't meaning that each type of inflammatory arthritis has a slightly different mechanism for how the inflammation happens. So psoriatic arthritis has a few medications that only work in psoriatic arthritis and some of the medications work with ankylosing spondylitis and psoriatic arthritis but don't necessarily work for rheumatoid arthritis. These are the most common uh, medications for each of these groups, but we do mix and match between uh, groups as well for some patients. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs tend to be the most effective medications for treating inflammatory arthritis, and they're also very readily available. So over-the-counter you can get ASA, which is aspirin, um, ibuprofen, which is Motrin or Advil, and naproxen, which is Aleve. They're also available as prescriptions, but in a higher strength. And then there's a slightly different medication called Celecoxib that has slight improvements in side effects. There's often patients who are not appropriate though to have anti-inflammatories and I'll talk about that in a minute. So the remaining choices really are acetaminophen, uh, opioids, or a combination of the two. And often if you just have one or two joints that are particularly bothersome and you don't want to or can't take uh, oral anti-inflammatory, we may use a topical ointment with the most common one being a uh, Voltaren MU gel, which is diclofenac, or a prescription strength uh, diclofenac gel, which is made at your pharmacy. But there are other ones available, but that's, that's probably the one that we would recommend the most. As I said, there is a lot of patients who are unable to or shouldn't take anti-inflammatories. Because they're available over the counter, many people are very comfortable using anti-inflammatories thinking that they're far more, less likely to cause problems than some of the prescription medications that we start you on and we see that list of side effects either at the pharmacy or if you do research on them and think, oh, I don't want to go on them. 
in actuality, anti-inflammatories are more likely to cause hospitalizations and death than all of the medications that we use put together. Um, admissions from anti-inflammatories are very high uh, in numbers and frequently it's because of heart attack and stroke. So the reason they increase the risk of heart attack and stroke is primarily by increasing blood pressure. They can also cause kidney and liver damage especially as you get older the kidneys are much more susceptible to the damaging effects of the anti-inflammatories. They can also cause stomach and intestinal ulcers, which also uh, can lead to bleeding. And because they increase the length of time it takes to clot, you would bleed more than if you weren't on them. As I mentioned, celecoxib is slightly different in that it is less likely to cause the bottom two. Um, just a bit about um, marijuana or the cannabinoids that are now legal and, and quite widely available. There's a lot of claims that are out there depending where you're looking, who you're talking to, what you're doing. Um, we are not experts in um, any of these things. There's no regulation to them. There's no particular standardized dose or any kind of guidelines for us to follow. Um, but generally speaking, um, we don't have any issue with use of them as long as you're not using it instead of um, the medications that we are recommending. They're still primarily symptom control. They're not disease modifying. And as was mentioned earlier, smoking it or vaping it into the lungs can be particularly detrimental to people with inflammatory arthritis. Um, and also just be cautious of um, the fact that sometimes there are negative and or dangerous side effects um, for people, um, especially those who are under the age of 25. Um, while we're on the subject of herbal or natural remedies, Remember that many of our actual drugs, such as hydroxychloroquine, um, actually are derived from these natural sources. And many of the over-the-counter natural remedies have side effects and drug interactions as well. So please do be careful. Um, but the biggest thing I want to make sure that you know is to avoid anything that's immune stimulating or immune support we're actually trying to modify how your immune system is working. We don't want to enhance it. Um, it can actually interfere with how well the medications work or it can cause flares. So it's something that you, you really need to look out for if you are planning on using them. And certainly you can contact me with whatever you're considering um, and I will help you decide if it's um, dangerous or if it's something that might be harmful to you. Many people know corticosteroids by the term cortisone and that's a type of corticosteroid. Um, there are many types of corticosteroids but they're all sort of descendants or uh, cousins of cortisol which is a hormone that's produced in your body and has many many functions but when we use it in higher doses it has immunosuppressant and anti-inflammatory activity which are both beneficial in treating uh, inflammatory arthritis they have the quickest response time so one Kenalog shot or another high dose uh, orally or, or intravenously has a time to effect of hours to days. If we give you a Kenalog shot today, most people will feel great within about 24 to 36 hours. These are medications that ideally should be used in the short, for the shortest amount of time and in the lowest doses possible in order to prevent side effects. There are some people who require long-term therapy, 
but it's not common when we're treating rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis or ankylosing spondylitis. Um, there are exceptions to that, but it's pretty rare that we need to use corticosteroids in, in higher doses for long periods of time. And the, probably the most important thing to know if you're ever on oral corticosteroids is that you must never stop it abruptly if you've been on it for more than two weeks. When you've been on it for a long time, it stops the body's ability to make it itself and the body needs it in order to function. So we always taper it down and we taper it um, quickly or slowly, mostly depending on how long you've been on it. The longer you're on it, the longer it takes to get you off it usually. And these are just showing you how we might use them. So you may hear us refer to the injectable steroids as a uh, Kenalog shot. Um, that's mostly what we use. Um, but for small joints, we often will use um, methylprednisolone or depomedrol. These drugs can be used intramuscularly if there's a lot of joints involved or if you have a lot of systemic symptoms. They can also be injected directly into the joint, which usually is only for one or two joints. It lasts longer and it tends to have less side effects. If those medications aren't effective or if they're only effective for a short period of time, that's often when we'll go to the oral tablets of prednisone. And a common dose would be to start at about 20 or 30 milligrams and then go down by about 5 milligrams every week for a period of about 6 to 8 weeks which allows the disease modifying agents to have time to start to work. For any medication for any disease that we use we're always weighing the risks and benefits. So the risks are in the red at the bottom and the benefits are at the top in the green used short term and in lower doses, the benefit often outweighs the risks and we don't often see these risks in short term use. So we can decrease pain, we can decrease swelling and really get you back doing more of your routine activities just by giving you a small course of corticosteroids. If used in high doses or used over long periods of time, then the risks sometimes outweigh the benefit, which is why we don't routinely use them long term. So even short term, um, there's some side effects that are quite common. The most common being um, sort of agitation, mood swings, difficulty sleeping, um, if you're a diabetic, it may be difficult to control your sugars after receiving corticosteroids. In some people who have um, congestive heart failure or have trouble with managing their blood pressure, that may cause a bit of an issue in them as well, even short term. Most of the rest of the things that you see are the concerns that we have with high dose or long term therapy and that is increased infections. So being on corticosteroids in high doses for long periods of time is probably the highest risk for infection of any of the medications that we may talk about and um, or put you on. They can also cause a decrease in the strength of muscle and bone. You can also increase your risk of a stomach ulcer um, especially if it's used in combination with anti-inflammatories without anything to protect your stomach. It can lead to what they call skin thinning, which really is just an easy bruising. It can affect your eyes and it can also increase your risk of having a heart attack or stroke, much in the same way that anti-inflammatories do. As healthcare professionals, we're often very good at telling you what the possible side effects of medications are. And often you'll hear it multiple times, often from the doctor, maybe from me or one of our nurses, and then again when you pick up your drugs at the pharmacy. 
we're not necessarily as good at telling you about the possible uh, possible complications of uncontrolled disease. So what happens if you don't take the medications? And often the complications that can occur from inflammatory arthritis happen in far higher percentages of patients than any of the side effects that we see in the medications that we choose. The other thing that's important to know is that we don't want the treatment to be worse than the disease, meaning we want the drug to be effective but also to be safe and we don't want you having side effects. There's enough medications for each of the diseases now for the most part that we can find a medication that is tolerable as well as effective. So don't think that just because these are appearing as possible side effects that you will have them or that you will have side effects to medications for your entire treatment. That's not how it works. I'm going to start with um, the complications of the uncontrolled disease which is on the right hand side. Ongoing fatigue is often one of the most disabling symptoms of inflammatory arthritis. The more inflammation that you have and the more active the disease is, usually the more fatigue that you have. You can see fatigue also appears on the left hand side and it's most common after methotrexate and uh, some of the biologics but certainly not all. Um, the fatigue or kind of the, the just bogginess or there's many ways people describe it, they're just kind of off for about a day or so after their methotrexate that's given once a week. That's very common. For most people it does get better over time but often even people who have been on it for a long period of time do feel just a little bit different, a little bit more tired, a little bit more just just not quite their best um, following methotrexate or sometimes rituximab or infliximab which are intravenous um, biologics um, that we have. All patients with inflammatory arthritis have an increased risk of heart disease and stroke and again the more inflammation that you have in your body the greater that risk is. So those with rheumatoid arthritis that have a lot of joints affected are going to have a higher risk than someone who has say ankylosing spondylitis with nothing but their spine affected. It's really quite highly variable. But the nice thing about this particular um, complication of having inflammatory arthritis is that if we're able to control the inflammation we also can decrease that risk of heart disease and stroke. So controlling the disease by controlling it with the medications also decreases that risk. So people who have rheumatoid arthritis are actually in the highest risk category along with people who have diabetes. But it's much easier um, generally speaking to decrease that inflammation and get the inflammatory arthritis under control and therefore decrease your risk. You may have a shortened lifespan and that's primarily due to both the increase in heart disease and stroke that I mentioned but also the increased risk of cancer. So the disease itself increases your risk of various types of cancers. And again, the more inflammation you have, the more likely you are to develop certain types of cancer. In particular with inflammatory arthritis, that's lymphomas, which is a, a cancer of the white blood cells. Um, oftentimes this increased risk of cancer is um, sort of associated with medication but in fact the disease also contributes to that higher risk of cancer. Again, it's often related to the amount of inflammation that you have in your body that we can potentially control with medication. 
osteoarthritis and permanent joint damage. 100% of people will develop this if they continue to go on for long periods of time with active disease. The same is true for osteoporosis, which is a thinning of the bone. Um, it happens frequently along the joints, but also because of inactivity and increase in inflammation, it can also lead to osteoporosis in other areas as well. You can have damage to lungs, which is um, not common, but the most common next to joint involvement um, with rheumatoid arthritis. Eyes are frequently involved in patients with ankylosing spondylitis. Blood vessels, heart and kidneys are really more the connective tissue diseases like lupus or vasculitis. We don't really hardly ever see any involvement um, from any of the most common types of inflammatory arthritis. Rheumatoid nodules are just little lumps that occur in some people who have rheumatoid arthritis. Generally, if we treat the disease early and we get it under control early, it's not something that we see. We, it's pretty rare um, that we see inflammatory uh, or rheumatoid nodules in patients um, unless they've had the disease for a really long time. Can also cause circulatory problems. So, um, inflammation can affect the blood vessels, particularly in the hands and the feet. Um, often, with treating the disease well, that will often improve or even go away. You can develop anemias. Um, so, inflammation does not allow the body to use iron properly. And iron is required by red blood cells to carry oxygen. So if you have a lot of inflammation or you have inflammation that goes on for a long period of time, you develop anemia. And that is often a reason why people also feel very fatigued. They're just not getting enough oxygen. If that inflammation is controlled, then the body starts using iron properly again, the red blood cells carry more oxygen, and you start to feel better. There's also an increased infection risk related to the disease itself. And again, it's variable. The more inflammation you have, the higher your risk for infection. And the reason that this happens is your, your immune system is not working properly. It's spending a lot of energy and cells and proteins that are, make up the inflammation attacking your own tissue that it becomes not very good at attacking viruses and bacteria. You also tend to be a bit more run down. You may not eat as much. All of those increase your risk. And Many studies have shown that very um, active disease has about the same infection risk as the traditional DMARDs, so methotrexate, um, leflunamide. So don't think of it as these medications are suppressing your immune system. They're just modifying it. So generally speaking, adding on a DMARD kind of cancels out the infection risk from um, the disease itself. So we're not really increasing your risk by that much by starting therapy. You can also develop skin lesions and rashes. Now, unfortunately, that's primarily um, with psoriatic arthritis. Most people develop psoriasis rash before they develop psoriatic arthritis, but it can also happen the opposite way. So they develop joint inflammation before they develop the rash. So if the joint inflammation comes first and it continues not to be well treated, sometimes that rash comes on. And when we're treating psoriatic arthritis in particular, we need to make sure that the drug is controlling both sides of that disease. As I mentioned, there's an increased risk of cancers. And also we want to really make this known because it's something that people often don't think of or are ashamed about. Depression is higher in people with inflammatory arthritis. 
inflammation actually interferes with the neurotransmitters in the brain. People who have, the studies mostly have been done in rheumatoid arthritis, but people who have large amounts of inflammation, about 30% of people develop symptoms of depression, which is much higher than people with chronic pain for other reasons. And often as the disease improves, the neurotransmitters kind of regulate themselves and that depression goes away. But it's really important to kind of keep that in mind. And if you do need treatment for that while we're getting your inflammatory disease under control, that's really important to, uh, to think about. All right, so those are all of the things that can happen if the disease goes on for longer periods of time. Now we can talk about really the rest of the side effects of medication. Nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea is the most common side effect of any drug out there. Um, in particular though, with those that are given orally, as the medication is given, if it's not fully absorbed or if you're particularly sensitive, it will kind of irritate your gastrointestinal system the whole way down. So methotrexate, leflunamide are the most likely to cause that. Um, however, with methotrexate, we're often able to manage that side effect without needing to switch medication. Um, hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine also can have some gastrointestinal side effects. But once we move into the injectables, particularly the injectable biologics, that's not something we actually see. Although you'll see it as a side effect on a lot of the biologics, a lot of the side effects on biologics are a bit misleading in that they're used in many different diseases and disease states. And often the side effect list that you see is related to other diseases. The same can be said for methotrexate. Um, a lot of the side effects that happen in very high dose um, methotrexate for cancer, we don't ever see in using it in our tiny little doses. So just keep that in mind. Um, Melsor is again most commonly with methotrexate. We are able to manage that usually uh, with out moving to another medication, but that's what we will do if we're not able to control it. We will move to a medication that doesn't cause you side effects. Um, skin rashes, any medication um, can cause a skin rash. That's the, one of the most common things that people get from medication. And for the most part, they're pretty um, simple and they go away once we stop the medication. In particular, if you're on sulfasalazine or are ever given sulfa antibiotics for uh, anything, that's something you really need to make sure you don't continue on. If you get a rash, if you're on sulfasalazine, you need to stop the sulfasalazine and call us right away. The rashes can get pretty nasty. Sun sensitivity um, happens with all of the medications pretty much except the biologics um, and the JAK inhibitors. Uh, Anti-inflammatories, methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, most of them. Um, and that's important because it increases your risk of a sunburn, which then increases your risk of skin cancer, which the disease already increases your risk of. So be a little more mindful um, of sunscreen and using sunscreen and covering up your skin um, while you're on these medications. Well, we monitor regularly as part of your blood work for liver damage. Liver damage is actually very uncommon. What we're measuring when we monitor your liver function tests is irritation to the liver. The liver is very good at fixing itself. So if we see that your liver enzymes are up, we know that there's some kind of liver irritation. And this can happen for a lot of things. If you get a severe cold or other infection, your liver function tests will go up. If you drink a lot and then go get your blood test the next day, your liver function tests will be up. 
And it's often not something people necessarily associate with um, alcohol, but certainly it's something often at the front of people's minds with methotrexate. Only if those liver enzymes are repeatedly elevated, that would be when we would stop the drug, decrease the drug, and actually developing liver damage is unusual if you are getting your monitoring done routinely. Kidney damage, um, although sometimes we have to adjust medication doses for um, how well your kidneys work, really the only ones that are really associated with uh, kidney damage or interference with how the kidneys work would be the anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, lung damage is listed as a side effect particularly of methotrexate but it's far more common for the disease to cause um, any respiratory issues than it is for methotrexate or any other other medication. Um, so oftentimes the involvement of the lungs from the disease is often blamed on the drug when in fact it isn't. So just keep that in mind. But if you're ever short of breath, you develop a cough, anything like that, you need to let us know. Um, and that would be outside of like a cold or an other infection. Um, eye damage, I, um, hydroxychloroquine, um, would be the one that most people are concerned about and I'll talk a little bit more about that on a separate slide. Um, blood problems, um, we do monitor your uh, blood work so your white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets and for some of the medications if we're using too much or if you're not clearing it very well sometimes those cells go below normal, which then is actually what we call immunosuppressed, um, whereas as long as those um, blood cells are within normal limits, usually they don't cause any problems. And so we do monitor that to make sure um, that we're giving you the right dosage. And if we do see that those levels are going too low, then we take care of that right away. Um, increased infection risk I already covered and it is highly variable. Hydroxychloroquine and sulfasalazine have no impact on infection risk. Um, methotrexate and leflunamide as I mentioned are similar to uh, the disease itself. And then when you get into the biologics, all the different classes, there's great differences in how much they impact your infection risk. Um, also, increased risk of some cancers I mostly covered already. Um, while methotrexate very rarely causes a certain uh, type of a lymphoma, mostly in people who've had mononucleosis in the past, um, it is a very mild, for lack of a better word, cancer and often um, is, it improves or goes away just with removal of the drug. True lymphoma, difficult to treat lymphoma, um, is really what's commonly associated with the disease, with it being about six to seven times higher in people who have uh, inflammatory arthritis than in people who don't. The risk of these cancers is low anyways, so six to seven times the low is still low, um, but it's something that you need to be cautious with because some of the drugs initially when they're tested have been associated with cancer, but then over time as we use them, we learn that actually that wasn't what was causing the cancers and it was actually the disease itself. To decrease the risk of side effects, these are really important things and they're hard things. But you need to know your own body and learn to recognize when something isn't right. And this is both for the disease and for the drug. If there's something going on, you may not be able to tell whether it's the drug or the disease, 
but we need to know about it. Keeping track of side effects when you have them, what exactly happens is important because it allows us to hone in on which drug is causing the problem and what we might need to do to be able to solve that problem. Ensure you take your medications regularly and as prescribed. Please don't lower or increase your medications without um, discussing it with uh, your rheumatologist or your family doctor or some of us here in the clinic. Um, we we have ways of adjusting medications and that make it more likely to be successful. Um, you need to keep your body healthy and strong. It's important to decrease stress, get appropriate sleep, engage in regular exercise, and try to eat a healthy diet. Um, I think it was mentioned in the prior uh, nursing lecture that there's no one particular diet, but Avoiding highly processed foods, avoiding high fructose, uh, high fructose uh, corn syrup, um, those are really important. Um, get your blood work done. Honestly, if you don't get anything else from this lecture, the importance of going for that blood work cannot be overemphasized. Um, if you get your blood work done, we're able to see a lot of problems both with the disease and with drugs long before there's actually any problem. And as you are on a medication for a um, long period of time with no side effects, then we decrease that monthly blood work to usually about every three to four months. And with some medications like the biologics, we, if you're not on other medications along with biologics, we don't have to monitor very often at all. So, just going to briefly talk about each of the disease modifying drugs. I've talked about the side effects for the most part, so there's just going to be a few little uh, tips as we go through these slides. So DMARTs are disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs. Now it's a little bit confusing because biologics. Jack inhibitors and some other drugs are also disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs. But when you hear the term DMARD, these medications are the ones we're typically talking about would be methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, sulfasalazine, and leflunamide. Premolast is a bit of an outlier in that it doesn't fit in the advanced therapy group as well, and it doesn't quite fit in the DMARDs, but it fits better in the DMARDs than it does with the JAK inhibitors and the biologics. And it's important to know that multiple medications may need to be combined to control your disease. It's better to use small amounts of multiple drugs that work in different ways than it is to use higher amounts of only one drug working in one single way. And that goes for any disease, not just with um, rheumatology. Methotrexate is our gold standard, meaning that it is the base drug typically to which all others are added if joints are involved. So people with ankylosing spondylitis who only have spine involvement, they are unlikely to see methotrexate. But if they have other what we call peripheral joints uh, involved, then you will. And any other type of inflammatory arthritis, methotrexate is really is often the gold standard. Um, methotrexate partially works by um, blocking how your cells use folic acid. The cells need folic acid in order to build their cell walls and maintain the structure. By fooling the body into using methotrexate instead of folic acid, that decreases the cells that are made. In particular, those that are being produced very rapidly. So that's why inflammatory cells are, um, it, 
it they per, in particular are affected, so that's why it works well for inflammatory arthritis without affecting a lot of other things. But because of that mechanism, it also can affect those cells that are also normally in how they work um, made quickly. So blood cells, hair is less so um, at low doses. We don't tend to see hair loss as a common thing and we do have ways of dealing with that. Um, skin cells, which is a good thing, that's why it works for psoriasis rash and for other types of skin disorders, um, as well as the liver um, and the gut, which causes some of those nausea issues that I talked about. Methotrexate is also used to treat certain cancers, but the doses are much higher and that's where a lot of the side effects that you see regarding methotrexate tend to be a bit misleading. The doses for cancer, the average dose per six week cycle is about 6,600 milligrams for an average size person. We use 20 to 25 milligrams and sometimes even less weekly. So it's almost like using two different drugs. So, and how it works in inflammatory arthritis is actually very different to how it works in cancer. It's taken once weekly, a maximum dose is 25 milligrams per week, and that's because at higher doses the side effects become worse um, or more frequent, and you don't get a lot of benefit um, to actually controlling the disease. Starts to work after about five to six doses, but it's a good 10 to 12 weeks before we really know um, if it's working the way it should. There's injectable and oral. Um, I'm not going to cover these too much. Um, just knowing that um, the injectable form tends to be better, um, more effective, and also have less side effects. The oral form is often not well absorbed, therefore you don't get the maximum benefit of the dose. So sometimes we may go strict like straight to injectable methotrexate and for other people we may go with the oral. Um, but it is important to know that injectable methotrexate must be tried before we can go on to any of the advanced therapy. Um, this is just to let you know um, that the methotrexate injections are typically um, administered by yourself and we do have methotrexate classes um, available to teach you how to inject. This is showing a vial, but there's also pre-filled syringes that may be um, helpful for people. So um, I'm not gonna go into the details of how to give it or those kinds of things that can be covered there if you do end up going on the injectable. I spent a long time already on side effects of the medications, um, but they're listed more specifically here. Um, the one thing I will draw your attention to is the bold line about limiting alcohol intake as directed by your rheumatologist. In the particular clinic that I work in, that ranges anywhere from you can have one drink once a year on a special occasion to just don't swallow your methotrexate pills with it. Somewhere in between is really the way to go. Um, studies have shown that um, no binge drinking, so limiting your alcohol to small amounts at a time, um, three to four times a week as recommended for all people um, by the Health Canada is probably very safe. There are some um, precautions though, if um, you have a history of problems with your liver or if you're on other medications that can also affect your liver. So there may be specific recommendations from your rheumatologist that you should really listen to. But most people do not have to eliminate it um, from their, their usual um, kind of social drinking or social activities, but I do recommend not having it on the day of or the day after your methotrexate dose. 
Methotrexate is actually a very interesting drug in that there's few drugs that we have that there is actually a treatment or a preventative for side effects. And in this case, it's folic acid, sometimes also known as folate, which is a B vitamin. Um, it's in your diet, but not in enough amounts to actually contradict uh, the effects of methotrexate. There is differences in scheduling just depending on the preferences of the rheumatologist. If it has been prescribed to take it daily, including the day of the methotrexate, don't change that. Sometimes pharmacists will tell you not to take it that way or somebody else may tell you that the methotrexate isn't as effective. Uh, there's actually not a lot of evidence to support that and in many cases it may actually be beneficial as far as side effects go. I will just mention one other thing quickly that is folinic acid which is a slightly different form of folic acid and it's usually given in instances where uh, folic acid just isn't quite enough or I think I mentioned earlier if there's some hair loss for some reason this particular form of folic acid actually works a bit better at least in my experience. The other strategies that sometimes we use especially if you are vegan or vegetarian or don't eat a lot of meat products or, um, or eggs etc you may not be getting enough vitamin B12 vitamin B12 and folate work together in their activities and I find that adding B12 in those circumstances can be helpful for those of you who are on the oral um, dividing the dose sometimes improves the ability to absorb it so there's less GI side effects from it um, as long as all of the tablets have been taken within the same day uh, then it's okay to do that the other biggest thing if it's nausea that is an issue Drinking lots and lots of water and keeping well hydrated is really important and there is a mechanism that causes that. Um, so the day of and the day after make sure you're well hydrated. If you're dehydrated you might find that you have a little bit more nausea otherwise. Um, hydroxychloroquine is an interesting drug. I just want to make a couple of points on this slide in that there was a lot of talk about hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine and side effects and overdosing when it comes to COVID. It's important to know that the issues that they were having with COVID may have been related to dose or to the effect of the virus on the body itself as well as um, combination of other drugs that they were using to treat it. We don't typically see side effects with hydroxychloroquine at the level that they were seeing when they were using it for COVID. So know that if we're using it appropriately to treat your inflammatory arthritis, um, typically it's a very well tolerated drug. Most people um, who are of average uh, weight or above are typically on two tablets a day. You can split them up or you can take them both at the same time. We do adjust for weight though to decrease any, any impact on eyesight. Um, these are a lot of the, the side effects we talked about already, but generally speaking, hydroxychloroquine is, is very uh, well tolerated. Eye toxicity, um, if you read stuff about it, they'll say that 8 to 10% of patients will show changes. That's very different than actually having noticeable eye damage. With all of the fancy diagnostics that are available um, in ophthalmology, they can now pick up very teeny, teeny, tiny um, changes in your eyes, which is a good thing. Um, but if we're made aware of any changes um, that are, are thought to be related to hydroxychloroquine, the optometrist or ophthalmologist lets us know and we would just stop it and any progression would subside once the drug is out of the body and really you would not notice any changes. Um, 
It is important though, in order to make sure we're catching things early, that you have your eyes checked once a year. Now, um, if we're very cautious um, in the US, the recommendation is to get a baseline, so sometime in the first year, and then not again for five years, but we like to make sure that you're getting one done once a year, and this is fully covered by Alberta Health. So any testing done by an ophthalmologist is covered. If you're seeing an optometrist, um, the visual field exam and the regular exam will be covered. If they decide to add special scans, there may be a charge there. Um, Sulfasalazine, I've pretty much um, covered most of it already, so I'm not going to spend much time on it. Um, again, if we start at a lower dose and taper it up over a few weeks, usually any gastrointestinal side effects are minimized. If you were to start at the full dose, usually that's when people call and say, I don't feel that well, my stomach's bothering me. Um, most frequently though, it's gas. Nausea and vomiting, diarrhea is certainly less frequent than uh, gas and stomach pain. I already mentioned the rash. Leflunamide is a medication that we typically um, reserve kind of to the last DMARD. And as I mentioned, we do need to try it. If you have rheumatoid arthritis, it's very likely that we would skip it for psoriatic arthritis because it's not required. Leflunamide has more side effects associated with it um, than the other medications do. People tend to be less tolerant often to the stomach side effects of leflunamide. As well, we have to be cautious in people who have high blood pressure. We may need to make adjustments to their medication, but even in people with normal blood pressure, kind of borderline blood pressure, um, it may lead to increases in blood pressure, um, which we, we really do need to um, make sure that we deal with. Uh, a Premalast or a Tesla, often where we would use this is in um, people who are very nervous about uh, moving on or or not or wanting to stop injectables, who have fears of injectables, um, or who have very mild disease that's just not responding or that you didn't tolerate the other medications. Um, it's really only used in psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis and another very rare rheumatic disease called Bichette's disease. Um, it's an oral medication taken twice daily. It does not require routine blood work, which is something um, people also um, often like, especially again if they're afraid of needles. Um, it can be used after methotrexate um, because you can't actually access this medication without trying injectable methotrexate, um, but it can be used along with methotrexate as well. Most commonly, um, the side effects are diarrhea, so it started at a lower dose and then increase, but also weight loss. Um, so in someone who is trying to lose weight or in whom obesity is an issue, this may actually be a very good drug choice, but it's not something that we use nearly as much as the other DMARDs or as um, much as the biologic agents in psoriatic arthritis. I'm not going to cover very much um, for biologics as only, like I said, about 20 to 25 percent of people with um, psoriatic arthritis or with rheumatoid arthritis end up on these advanced agents. Um, people with uh, ankylosing spondylitis, those numbers are higher simply because there's not a lot of traditional DMARDs that are effective. So people who have ankylosing spondylitis, we often just move straight from um, the anti-inflammatories straight to a biologic um, unless, as I mentioned earlier, you have involvement of other joints as well, then we may use uh, sulfasalazine or methotrexate. I'm not going to cover much on biologic DMARDs. Um, 
They are the ones that you typically see a lot of advertising for. Um, you may have heard that they're very expensive, but we have many ways of taking care of the costs of biologic DMARDs. So that's not something if they anybody mentions that you need to be on a biologic, don't think that cost will be an issue for you. Um, what a biologic is, is a drug, but it's not a typical chemical drug like most other drugs that you've tried before or been or even heard of before. They are antibodies or parts of antibodies or similar that are created outside of the body specifically to go in and attach to cells or proteins that ultimately cause the inflammation and the damage from the disease. There are numerous different classes of biologics and each class has differences in infection risk, in side effects, and also in what diseases they work best for. Um, biologics are not necessarily more effective than the other medications, so don't think that the prior medications that I talked about are inferior. They're not. Um, the uh, majority of people are managed on those traditional DMARDs. These are just different. So it takes a while for some people and not so long for others to find the drug that will work best for you. And it unfortunately is a matter of trial and error. So if one doesn't work or doesn't work optimally, we have lots of other choices. It just takes some time and some patience. This is just what I meant uh, when I was talking about chemical drugs versus biologic drugs and why they're called that. Um, if you remember way back to um, high school chemistry, um, most drugs are traditional chemicals that need to be broken down in the liver and or the kidney and that's where we have things like drug interactions and a lot of the side effects and some of the things that we need to monitor for. For the most part, with only a couple of exceptions, um, biologic drugs don't have a lot of interactions um, and we don't have to worry as much about um, kidney and liver and dosing as we do sort of the more traditional uh, drugs. These are just all of the available biologics. This is where I mentioned earlier that the classes that they're in are based on the um, protein or the cell that they work on. Many people sort of mix up JAK inhibitors and biologics. JAK inhibitors and biologics are quite different beings, but the end result in what they do and the types of side effects that they can cause are in many ways similar. JAK inhibitors have similarities to traditional disease modifying agents as well. They are oral, daily or twice daily medications, depending on what you have and which formulation that you have. And they affect the ability of the body to produce inflammatory proteins. If you can't produce inflammatory proteins, you then can't bring into the inflammatory mixture other cells and other proteins that then contribute to even more inflammation. Infection concerns are similar to the biologic agents. However, they do seem to have a higher risk of developing shingles. So the younger you are, typically the lower your risk of shingles. The older you are, the higher the risk of shingles. And the JAK inhibitors increase that risk by about six to seven times. So if you're 20, say your risk is, you know, one out of every few hundred, then increasing that risk by six or seven times isn't going to make much of a difference. But in someone who's 85, where their risk is 50-50 of developing shingles, 
increasing that can be very concerning. Fortunately, the, there's a very effective shingles vaccine out there called Shingrix. Um, I think that was talked about previously. And it can be provided through insurance companies. So if you have private insurance through your work and you're 50 or over, they may cover that. For anyone else, currently, the companies that make these drugs are providing the Shingrix vaccine to those who want it and for whom it's not typically covered. That then can help to decrease that risk back of developing shingles. As I mentioned before, they do have similarities to the traditional DMARDs in that the side effects that traditionally are associated with um, the DMARDs of increases in liver function tests, decreases in blood cells where we have to monitor with blood work, that has to be done with these as well. And of course, any oral medication can in sensitive people cause nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. I have not seen a lot of that with these medications. Generally, it's been fairly mild, but certainly some people are very, very sensitive to oral medications. Drug interactions can also be a concern um, for people with these medications, unlike most of our traditional medications or with biologics. However, many of those interactions aren't really relevant in that they don't affect how well this drug or the other drug works or there's only a minor change. So we're often getting called about interactions with these medications, but fortunately most of them can be dealt with very, very easily. This slide is a bit busy and I'm sorry, but it's just a visual description of what the inflammatory proteins are that are affected by JAK inhibitors and biologics, and how those proteins and cells cause damage in a joint. On the left-hand side is an inflamed knee, and it shows the process of how inflammation builds and causes damage in that knee. So the body activates white blood cells to cause the inflammation in your joints. That T cell releases TNF-alpha, which is kind of the granddaddy of all of the uh, inflammatory proteins. It then causes other inflammatory white blood cells to come to the party. And that inflammatory white blood cell then also releases other types of inflammatory proteins called interleukins, and there's many, many of them. IL-6, IL-1, IL-17, IL-23, really any of those inflammatory proteins are potential targets for biologics. TNF-alpha is also released and also increases a lot of those proteins becoming available. So it's a cycle that really ends in damage to the joint. It affects chondrocytes, which affect the cartilage, so the cartilage becomes damaged. Osteoclasts are also um, brought into the mix and they break down bone and cause erosions, which you may have heard of your doctor talking about in your x-rays. As well, they may trigger fibroblasts, which lead to thickening of the um, lining of the joint, which can, again, cause problems in how well the joint moves and works. JAK inhibitors are very interesting in that they are taken in by those T cells. So that very first cell that has become activated that starts the process, when that activation occurs, the JAK inhibitor gets into the cell and changes how that cell works so that those inflammatory proteins can't be released and all of those other cells are not triggered to be brought in and cause inflammation and damage. Biologics do the same thing, but they do it differently. Biologics are proteins that have to be injected because they are primarily antibodies or other proteins that work like antibodies. And what they do is they can work in really three different ways. 
they can attach to a receptor on that cell that will get the protein. And once that happens, it causes a release of other inflammatory proteins or activation of other cell uh, types of cells. If the area where those proteins normally go can't be accessed, then they never are able to come together and they're never able to create that inflammation. It can also attach directly to the cell itself and it can cause changes in the cell, again, which decreases the release of those inflammatory proteins and molecules, or it can attach to those inflammatory cells directly and take those proteins out of the system. So because there's sort of three mechanisms as to how that works, even though a medication is in the same class, such as where we have five uh, TNF inhibitors, how they actually cause that N decrease in TNF might be different. So one may work slightly better than another, or one may cause less side effects than another. Um, that's why there's a little bit of difference, even in, within the same type of drug. This is a topic that comes up very frequently, infections and arthritis medications. People are often very concerned about taking their medication and what that might do to their ability to fight off infections, or if they do have an infection, their ability to get over infections. As I mentioned earlier, infection risk is not just related to the medications. Active disease also plays a role. Medications used in combination, some can be more of a concern than others. And people who have risks not related to medications, such as those with lung disease, like COPD or asthma, those who have kidney disease, uh, poorly controlled diabetes, are of an advanced age or are taking large amounts of prednisone, those are your biggest risks typically for infection. Many of the medications don't need to be stopped, but biologics and JAK inhibitors should be held if you have any of these signs that are in the middle of the page here. Fever, chills, cloudy or strong smelling urine, often that is painful to pass. If you have greenish mucus coming from your nose or when you cough, night sweats, flushing, sweating that's different from what you may have uh, typically, such as if you're menopausal, or if you have a severe sore throat, particularly one that makes it difficult to swallow. Also, if you have any kinds of sores that are uh, open and pussy, are hot or have redness or inflammation, or if there are red streaks that are coming from that uh, sore, then those are all indications of infection. You are typically not more likely to catch something than anyone else, so colds and flus, you're not more likely to get than if you weren't on the medication. That seems to be true with COVID as well, but they may be longer or seem more severe, and there's an increased risk of secondary bacterial infections. So again, you do need to be cautious. Make sure you're washing your hands, using masks in public, um, for COVID in particular, and carrying around that hand sanitizer as well is very helpful in preventing infections. Hydroxychloroquine and sulfasalazine do not suppress the immune system and can be continued through any type of sickness. Methotrexate and leflunamide are also generally continued except for the most severe infections. However, biologics and JAK inhibitors, they should be stopped at any sign that you have an infection and not continued until antibiotics or antivirals are completed or until the symptoms are improving. 
if you have any question about whether or not to hold it or not, hold it and call and get further advice on what to do. Same with resuming. If you're not sure when you should resume, you should get some uh, medical advice for doing so. Concerns around medications and conceiving a child as well as breastfeeding an infant are very common concerns that many, many people have, both male and female. If you are thinking of becoming pregnant or you are planning to conceive a child with your female partner, it's important to let your rheumatologist know early. For men, the majority of medications do not pose any problems and can be continued. For women, many of them do need to be assessed or changed. Uh, many need to be stopped for at least three months, particularly methotrexate, in order to uh, get the medication out safely before you're able to uh, have a baby. Sulfasalazine and hydroxychloroquine, many medications that are very commonly used in these types of arthritis, are safe in pregnancy and are often continued throughout. The methotrexate, as I mentioned, needs to be stopped three months in advance. And leflunamide is a special medication that takes two years to get out of the system or we need to go through a special procedure. So even if you're not immediately thinking of conceiving a child, it's important to let your rheumatologist know as that may alter what medications that we decide to use for you. Biologic medications that we have enough information on are generally considered to be safe in pregnancy and in all of them are considered to be safe in breastfeeding. Um, that is because the molecules are so large that in breastfeeding it's not able to pass into the milk and therefore get to the baby but also any that does is quickly deactivated by the enzymes and the stomach acid in the baby, which is why we can't typically give biologics orally. Jack inhibitors, there's not currently good recommendations around those, but they are out of the system quite quickly. Um, some medications may also affect your ability to make a baby. So anti-inflammatories and sulfasalazine in particular. So that's also something that needs to be discussed when you're attempting to conceive a child. If you are breastfeeding, in addition to stopping some medications, um, it may be that you need to adjust your feeding times or may need to pump. And that can all be discussed during the pregnancy and having a good plan for uh, after childbirth. Other issues that come up fairly often regarding the medications is a little bit interesting. We're often called about drug interactions and oftentimes the pharmacists or even family doctors can become very concerned as they get warnings about certain medications being used together when they are uh, entering your prescription into their computer. In fact, the majority of our drugs have minimal clinically important interactions. Doesn't mean they are not interacting with other drugs. It just means that that interaction isn't clinically important. So if a pharmacist or someone else tells you that you need to stop a particular medication or hold a particular medication because of an interaction, you need to make sure that they call us or that you call us to confirm we don't want you stopping medications that we've prescribed you without talking to us first. And in most instances, it's not a concern or can be managed very easily. Planning for surgery. Your DMAR medications should not be stopped except in the most rare instances, but biologics do need to be. Unfortunately, many surgeons, dentists, podiatrists, whoever else is doing those kinds of procedures often are not familiar with these medications and will want to hold them unnecessarily or hold them for longer than is necessary, which can then lead you to flare up in your symptoms and we then may need to treat with other things that 
may also be problematic. So if someone is telling you to hold or to stop your medication for any kind of procedure, please call the clinic for advice and we will let you know exactly what to do and when. Medications do not affect regular dental work or minor procedures. So anything that's minimally invasive, things like fillings, cleanings, um, any kind of, you know, foot corns, those kinds of things that are often done in offices, those don't typically need to have any kind of stoppage in the medications. So in summary, active inflammatory disease has many long-term risks. Ensure that you're considering all of them in addition to the medication side effects. Be patient with your medications. They do take a long time to work and to get the right combination. Do not stop taking your medication or change your dose without discussing with one of the rheumatology team members. Take your medication regularly and consistently. Be cautious about other drugs, herbal remedies, uh, vitamins, etc. Go for your monitoring regularly. If you don't remember anything else, this is the most important part of the medication section. The monitoring identifies problems very early before it could cause a complication for you long term. Please contact your family physician, walk-in clinic or emergency room depending on the severity of your symptoms if you suspect an infection and keep track of your symptoms and side effects and let us know when they occurred, how they occurred at your next visit. That helps us to know exactly what might be causing it or triggering it. And thank you, that's the end of the medication section.